Hello, it's Richard Hammock's Calculus One. We are in part four of the course on applications of derivatives. This is lecture 33, Global Extrema. Most recently, in lectures 31 and 32, we talked about local extrema, which you can view as the tops of the hills and the bottoms of the valleys of a function and their locations. With global extrema, roughly speaking, what we're concerned with is the absolute highest hill on the graph of a function, or the absolute lowest valley on the graph. And where are they? The goal is this. Given a function f of x, you want to find an x that makes f of x as large as possible. That is, an x that maximizes f of x. Or find an x that makes f of x as small as possible that minimizes f of x. So for instance, if this is our f of x, you can see that f of x attains its largest value right there, its highest value at c. It has some other local maximums like right here, but right there, that's its highest value. That's what we're concerned with today. And right here at this endpoint, right there at zero, in this function, f of x attains its smallest value. So we'll be concerned with where are these x values that make f the largest it could possibly be or the smallest it could possibly be. For example, if you had a function p of x that gave profit, you might want to find an x that maximizes that. If c of x is cost, you want to find an x that minimizes that. So the basic theme and the applications of global extrema is to maximize the good and minimize the bad. And that's important in applications. Let's lay out the main definitions. Suppose f is defined on a domain d. Usually d is an interval. It could be the natural domain of f, or maybe it's some interval determined by an application. We say f has a global maximum at x equals c if f of c is greater than or equal to f of x for all x in d. In other words, f of c is as big as you could possibly get. For example, here's an f of x defined on this domain d, this interval, and it looks like right about here is an x value c such that f of x is as big as you could get. If you took any other x and looked at f of x, f of c is greater than or equal to f of x. So according to this definition, f has a global maximum at x equals c. We say f has a global minimum at x equals some number little d if f of d is less than or equal to f of x for all x in the interval. In other words, f of d is as small as you could get. And that looks like it happens about right there. Here's a d value for x, and f of d is here. It's less than or equal to f of x for any x. So this function has a global minimum at x equals d. Another example, here's a different function f. And if you look at the global maximum, it's way up here at f of c. And notice that that could happen and does happen at two different values of c. And that's a possibility. This f of c for either of those c's, it's greater than or equal to f of x for any other x in the interval. So f has a global maximum at x equals c. What about the global minimum? It looks like it happens right there at the end point. Right there, at that end point, call it d f of d is as small as you could get on the function. So we would say that f has a global minimum at x equals this d. And that's interesting because that endpoint, it's not even a critical point of the function, but yet we have a global minimum there. And we'll see that happen. Some terminology, if f has a global maximum at x equals c, then that y value of f of c 
is called the global maximum of f at c. So this y value is the global maximum of this function, and it occurs at an x value of c. Likewise, if f has a global minimum at x equals d, then that y value f of d, that is called the global minimum of f, and it occurs at this y val x value of d. Collectively, these f of c's and f of d's, they're called the global extrema of f on the interval. And be aware that different texts use different words. Sometimes global extrema are referred to as absolute extrema. I'll tend to use global extrema, but sometimes I'll say absolute extrema. They mean the same thing. Let's look at some examples. Here's a function f of x, and the domain d is the entire real line, so an infinite interval. You can see we have a global minimum right here at x equals 1, a global minimum of negative 1. And there's no global maximum, because for any x you pick, you can always get higher. So there's no highest point on this graph. Here's exactly the same function, but we're going to restrict it to the domain d from negative 2 to 3, that closed interval. And we still have a global minimum at x equals 1, but now we've picked up a global maximum, because if you plug in negative 2, you're way up here. That's as high as you can get for this function on this interval. So we have a global maximum at x equals minus 2. Here's another example. This cubic curve that's defined on d equals the entire real line, for this one, there's no global minimum and there's no global maximum. You can, wherever you are, you can always get lower. So there's no global minimum. And wherever you are on that function, at any f of c, you can always get higher. So there's no global maximum. Another example. Take this linear function that's defined on the closed interval from minus 2 to 2. You can see that we have a global minimum at x equals minus 2, right there, that's as low as you can get, and a global maximum that occurs here at x equals 2. We're going to look at that exact same function, but we're going to change the interval slightly. We're going to make it open on the left and closed on the end. So it looks like this, and here's the graph of our f of x. This point, negative 2, is not included in that interval. Now, in this example, this function has no global minimum on that interval. The reason being is if you take any x, any c, in this interval, like right there, and look at f of c, you can always get lower by going just a little bit closer to x equals minus 2. Mind you, minus 2 is not included in the interval, so you can't plug that into the function, but you can always get lower than any f of c by moving to the left. Now we still have a global maximum at x equals 2, it's right there. What if we looked at the exact same function, but on the open interval from minus 2 to 2? In this case, there's no global minimum on d, and there's no global maximum. There's not a global maximum because if you think about taking any c in this interval, which cannot be 2, it's got to be less than 2, and looking at f of c, you could always get a little higher than that by moving just closer to 2, x equals 2. So there's no global maximum and no global minimum in this example. In these three examples, the function was exactly the same, but the interval changed, and you'll notice that influenced the global extrema. The takeaway from these examples is that global extrema, they can depend on that interval d 
on which the function is defined. You change the interval, you could change the global extrema. Another takeaway is from all the examples that we've looked at, there are two places that you could find global extrema. You could happen to have a global extremum at a critical point inside that interval, or maybe you get a global extremum at an end point of an interval, like right here or right there. Global extrema occur at critical points and end points. So we're going to be all about finding global extrema. If you think about the examples we've looked at, to find global extrema of f on a closed interval that has both of those endpoints, we know where to look, the critical points and the endpoints, the two endpoints a and b of the interval, and also the critical points. And you can see in this example you have a global minimum at this critical point c and a global maximum at this endpoint b. It's going to turn out that closed intervals are really convenient for us. Open intervals are not so simple. It's not so simple if the interval is not closed, because if you think about it, if these endpoints A and B of your function weren't allowed, like maybe if the function is not even defined at A or B, how do you know you have a global maximum at this C? What happens towards B? Does the function get higher than that? Does it not get higher? If you don't have the graph of that function in front of you, and sometimes even if you do, that could be hard to tell. So that's a little bit tricky. But we'll deal with both of these. Here is today's plan. The first thing we're going to do is develop a procedure for finding the global extrema on a closed interval, like this situation. And then we'll take a look at finding global extrema on a non-closed interval, like something like this. That's our plan. So let's start with task one. Let's look at finding global extrema on closed intervals. For this, there's a theorem that is useful to know about. It's called the extreme value theorem. And it says that if a function f is continuous on a closed interval from a to b, then it has both a global maximum and a global minimum on that interval. And this is very plausible when you think about it. You totally believe this because take a function f of x that's continuous and it's defined on a closed interval. And think of that as a physical piece of wire, a finite piece of wire with those two endpoints, here and here. It's made of metal. And take a straight edge below that curve and then move it up to the curve and somewhere metal will hit metal right there at some x value of c and that's your global minimum. It has to exist. For a global maximum, take that metal straight edge up at the top above the function, above the wire, move it down and at some point metal hits metal right there at, in this case at x equals a and that's your global maximum. So it's very believable. And actually, to, to prove this theorem, we're not going to do it in the text. It's, it's kind of subtle. You might tackle this in an advanced calculus class. But what I want to indicate to you here is that it's a very believable theorem, very intuitive. I should point out that continuity is essential here for this to hold. If that function f of x is not continuous, like here, you may not have a global extremum. This function has no global maximum nor global minimum. You want to say the global minimum is right here at x equals c, but no, that's right, the f of c is up here. It's not as small as you can get. And likewise, no global maximum. So continuity here is absolutely essential. So this says that whenever you have a continuous function on a closed interval, then you're guaranteed to have a global maximum and a global minimum. So if you're looking for them, you at least know they exist. And if you think about what we've done so far, you can put it together 
to a procedure that finds all global extrema of f on a closed interval a, b. We said that, that would, they would happen at endpoints and critical points. So how would you find the global extrema? Well, they could possibly happen at critical points. So first of all, you find all the critical points c of f that are in that interval from a to b. Then compute f of a, which is one endpoint, and then f of b, which is the other endpoint, and also plug each of those critical points from step one into your function. And you're going to get a bunch of y values, f of the two endpoints and f of all the critical points. And your global maximum is guaranteed to be among those function values, and likewise the global minimum. In step three, we just note that the largest value from step, from step two is the global maximum, and the smallest value from step two is your global minimum. So it's a very simple procedure for finding abs absolute or global extrema of a function on a closed interval. Of course, your function has to be continuous for this to work, but we're doing calculus, we're dealing with differentiable functions, so differentiability implies continuity, so continuity is always going to be a given for us. Let's look at an example of our procedure. Let's find the global extrema of the function f of x equals the cube root of x squared minus 4 thirds x on the closed interval from 0 to 27. So step one was to find all the critical points that are in the interval. So to find those critical points, of course, you first of all have to compute the derivative f prime of x. And we know how to do that. I'll leave the details for you. f prime of x is 2 over 3 cube root of x minus 4 thirds when you work it out using the power rule. And you'll notice right off the bat that f prime of 0 is not defined because that would involve division by 0. So x equals 0 is a critical point of our function. And for any other x value, you could take its cube root. So f prime of any other x value is defined. So to find the other critical points, we know we have to solve the equation f prime of x equals 0. And let's do that. Here's f prime, set it equal to 0. Get that negative 4 thirds off to the other side. And now let's cross multiply. We get 12 cube root of x equals 6. Divide both sides by 12. We get the cube root of x equals a half. And now you're going to cube both sides. So x equals 1 half cubed, which is 1 eighth. So we found two critical points, 0 and 1 eighth. Those are the critical points for f. And you'll notice that x equals 0, that critical point, it just so happens to be an endpoint of the interval. So it's both an endpoint and a critical point. And that can happen sometimes. So that was step one of our procedure. We found the critical points. In step two, remember, you take each of those critical points and you plug them into the function, and you take the endpoints and you plug them into the function. So let's first let's do the endpoints first. X equals zero. Well, actually, that's also a critical point, but either way, you plug it into f. F of zero is, and remember, you're going all the way back up to the original f, not the derivative, but f. That's our object of study. F of zero would be zero cubed minus four thirds times zero, and that's zero. Okay, good. Let's take the next endpoint, the other endpoint, 27, plug that into the function. f of 27 is the cube root of 27 squared minus 4 thirds times 27, and the cube root of 27 is 3 squared is 9, 4 thirds times 27 is 36, so 9 minus 36, and we get negative 27 f of 27 is a y value of negative 27. 
One more thing to plug in. We've plugged in the two endpoints. We haven't plugged in this critical point of 1 8 yet. We've got to do that. That's in the interval, after all. So f of 1 8, 1 8 would be the cube root of 1 8 squared minus 4 thirds times 1 8. And the cube root of 1 8 is a half, and that squared is 1 fourth. And minus 4 thirds times 1 8 is minus 1 sixth. Let's get a common denominator there. That's uh, 1 fourth is 3 twelfths. Minus 1 sixth is minus 2 twelfths. So we get 1 twelfth. F of 1 eighth equals 1 twelfth. So that completes step two. We've plugged the endpoints and the critical points into the function f. And in step three, remember, you look for the largest of these, and that's going to be your global maximum. And the largest of these three y values, it's 1 12th. It's definitely bigger than 0 and this negative number, 27, negative 27. So we have a global maximum of 1 12th at x equals 1 8th. And what about the global minimum? It's definitely this negative value. We have a global minimum of negative 27 that occurs at x equals 27. And we're done. Simple procedure. We didn't even have to compute the graph. You just follow the procedure. Didn't have to draw the graph. Now, if you did want to draw the graph, I'll tell you what it looks like. It looks something like this. It goes up. Right there at 1 8th, you have an absolute maximum. And then it goes down. So you get your lowest point here at f of 27 equals negative 27. Here's another example of our procedure for finding the global extrema of a function on a closed interval. Find the global extrema of the function f of x equals x times the quantity sine x minus cosine x plus cosine x plus sine x on the closed interval from pi over 2 to pi. So the interval is closed, so we can apply our procedure. The first step is to find the critical points so we need to compute the derivative. Now, f starts out as a product, x times this other function, so we, we've got to begin with the product rule. f prime of x is the derivative of x, which is 1, times the function sine x minus cosine x, and then the other way around, plus x times the derivative of sine x minus cosine x, which is cosine x plus sine x, and then the derivative of cosine x is minus sine x, the derivative of sine x is plus cosine x. So there's our f prime, and it looks complicated, but notice you have a sine of x minus a sine of x, a negative cosine of x plus a cosine of x, and those cancel out, and all we're left with is this middle part. f prime of x equals x times the quantity cosine x plus sine x. We're looking for critical points, so first of all, we should think about are there any values of x for which f prime is undefined? Well, it's defined for all values of x, so there are no critical points c for which f prime of c is undefined. There could be some critical points where the derivative is equal to 0, so to find those other critical points, we solve the equation f prime of x equals 0. And here's our f prime put it equal to zero. It's already factored, so you can start off reading critical points right there. x equals zero satisfies this equation. So zero is one of our critical points. So either x equals zero or this other factor, cosine x plus sine x equals zero. So if we have a value of x for which cosine x plus sine x is a zero, that's another critical point. And to find that x, think about the unit circle. Our interval is from pi over 2 to pi, so we are in this second quadrant, and we're looking for a value of x that makes cosine x plus sine x 0. Well, x equals 3 pi over 4 does the trick, because sine of that is square root of 2 over 2, cosine of that is negative square root of 2 over 2, and they add up to 0. So that factor, cosine x plus sine x, equals 0 if x equals 3 pi over 4. So together we have our critical points, x equals 0 
and also x equals 3 pi over 4 makes f prime 0. But watch out, this x equals 0 right there, it's not in the interval. The interval is from pi over 2 to pi. That does not include 0. 0 is way over here on the unit circle. So remember, our procedure only uses critical points that are in the interval, so we're going to throw 0 away. The only critical point in that interval is 3 pi over 4. So good. We've completed step 1. We've found all the critical points that are in the interval. Step two is to plug in the endpoints and those critical points. So let's do that. We'll start off with this endpoint of pi over 2. f of pi over 2 is, let's see, you're, you're plugging into the original f. So that's pi over 2 times sine pi over 2 minus cosine pi over 2 plus cosine pi over 2 plus sine pi over 2. Now, cosine pi over 2 is 0 and sine pi over 2 is 1. So we're left with pi over 2 times 1 minus 0 plus 0 plus 1. And that's pi over 2 plus 1, which is approximately 2.57. Let's move on. Let's do this critical point now, 3 pi over 4. f of 3 pi over 4 would be, here's 3 pi over 4 plugged into f. And if you work that out, remember sine of 3 pi over 4 is square root of 2 over 2, cosine is minus square root of 2 over 2. So working that out, you'll check and you'll see that you get 3 pi over 4 times the square root of 2, which is approximately 3.3. And finally, let's plug in pi, the other endpoint. f of pi is, plug in pi everywhere you see an x up here, pi times sine of pi minus cosine pi plus cosine pi times plus sine pi, and sine of pi is 0, cosine of pi is negative 1. So this works out to be pi minus 1, which is approximately 2.14. So that was step 2. We plug the endpoints and the critical points into the interval. And the next thing we're going to do is take the biggest one, the biggest value from step 2. That's our maximum. And you can see right here, it's this value, f of 3 pi over 4. So the global maximum is that y value of 3 pi over 4 times square root of 2, and it occurs at x equals 3 pi over 4. That's our global maximum. And what about the global minimum? The smallest value is this pi minus 1. So the global minimum is that y value of pi minus 1, and it happens at x equals pi. So there we go. Our procedure gave us the global maximum and the global minimum of f on this closed interval. We're going to move on now to our second goal for today. Remember, our plan was to, first of all, develop a procedure for finding the absolute or global extrema of a function on a closed interval, and we've done that. We'll move on now to our second goal, and that was to examine global extrema on an interval that's not closed. We don't yet have a way to find the global extrema of a function on, say, an open interval, and we mentioned that that can be tricky because if the endpoints are, let's say, not even defined when you plug them into the function, so you're on an open interval, do you have a global maximum right here? It's hard to say because you may not know the behavior of that function near b. Does it go up above, higher than this point, or does it not? It may be hard to say. But there is one situation in which you can make a definite conclusion. Imagine that you have an interval where there is exactly one local extremum. Like, for example, a local maximum right here. Your function was rising up to that point, and then it started decreasing. In that situation, you can say with certainty that that local maximum 
of f of c is also a global maximum because you couldn't get higher than that because you keep going down after you reach that point and you were lower down before you got to it. So that is a fact that actually turns out to be incredibly useful to us. The global extrema on an interval i, and this works for whether that interval is open, closed, or half open. If f is continuous on the interval i and there is only one local extremum on i, then you can say if there's a local max, if that extremum is a local max, then it's going to be a global max, just as in this picture. And if you turn this picture upside down, you get a similar statement. If that single local extremum is a local minimum, then it's guaranteed to be a global minimum. So this only works, or is only guaranteed to work, when you have just one extremum, local extremum, in your interval. But as it turns out, in most applications, that's going to be the case anyway, so it's going to be useful to us. Let's look at an example of that. Let's find the global extrema of the function f of x equals e to the power of x squared minus 5x plus 6 on the open interval from 0 to 4. Okay, so this interval is open, so we can't use our old procedure for closed intervals. So what are we going to do? Well, the strategy is to look for local extrema and hope there's only one. And in that case, we can apply our result from the previous slide. So let's check. To find the local extrema, we first of all have to find the critical points, and that involves computing the derivative. And the derivative e to the x squared minus 5x plus 6 is e to the x squared minus 5x plus 6 times 2x minus 5, the derivative of that power. And to find the critical points, we set that equal to 0. And let's see, what's x going to be? e to any power is positive. So this factor can't be 0. But the 2x minus 5 could be 0 if x were 5 halves. So our critical point is x equals 5 halves. And that is in this interval from 0 to 4. So we're in a situation where we have only one critical point in our interval. x equals 5 halves right here. And let's think about whether we have a local max or a local minimum there. Look at the sign of f prime. f prime of x is e to this power, which is always positive. e to any power is positive. Then times 2x minus 5. Well, it's if x is bigger than 5 halves, that 2x minus 5 is positive. If x is less than 5 halves, that 2x minus 5 is negative. So f prime of x changed from negative to positive at 5 halves. So we have a local minimum by the first derivative test. So our result from the previous slide said in a situation like this where you only have one local extremum, if it's, a glo if it's a local minimum, then it is a global minimum. So we can say that f has a global minimum at x equals 5 halves and no global maximum. You almost don't have to remember the result from the previous slide because if you just carry out this procedure and sketch in the graph of your function, you can see that you've got a global minimum right there at 5 halves. It's, it's almost like you don't even have to think about it. So keep this in mind. You'll have opportunity to use this technique in the future. So that's it for today. A quick recap. We have two big results. We know how to find all the extrema, the global extrema of f on a closed interval. And for an interval that's not closed, we have a, a, a useful result. It's, it's, it's not as good as you might hope it would be, but it turns out to be very useful. If f is continuous on an interval and there's only one local extremum on that interval, then if it's a local max, it's a global max. If it's a local min, it's a global min. 
So get some practice with this. Coming up in Lecture 34, we're going to apply this knowledge to practical problems. So I'll see you then, and goodbye.